Take your Bibles and turn over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. Turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, as we continue our series, Why We Can Trust the Bible. In respect for the Word of God, let me ask you to stand as I read, beginning in verse 1 of Mark 7. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they carefully washed their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves, and there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. And the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat the bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or his mother, Whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. I asked you a question last week, and I shall ask it again this week. Why would a thinking 21st century person put their complete trust and confidence in a 2,000-year-old book? Has not man's knowledge greatly increased in 2,000 years? Would not books written today be better and more helpful to us? Why place your trust in a book written over 2,000 years ago? Does a person have to put his mind in neutral in order to accept the Bible as God's authoritative word? Do you have to commit intellectual suicide if you're going to accept the scriptures as God's guide for your life? And the answer I gave last week is the same as I'll give this week, and that is no, you do not. Because the Bible is God's word, we have sound, intelligent reasons for believing it to be so. Because the word of God is his very word. Our faith is based on solid evidence. Now there is an element of faith involved. Don't mistake what I'm saying. And that shouldn't surprise you. Because the Bible says what is without faith is sin. And without faith it is impossible to please God. And so you cannot take a man and simply reason with him to the place that he will accept the Bible as God's authoritative word with no faith. But our faith is based on solid, reasonable evidence. And we're looking at that evidence in this series. Last week we looked at the first evidence. And that is that the Bible claims to be the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is God-breathed. And over 
3,800 times the Bible claims to be the very Word of God. And that's where we must start. Obviously, if that were the only thing we had going for us, then we might be in trouble. Because there are other books that claim to be God's Word. The Koran claims to be the Word of God. But if the Bible did not claim to be God's Word, then how could we place that upon it? And so what we saw last week was some of the abundant evidence that is within the Bible itself that it claims, assumes to be the very Word of God. For our second evidence, today we turn to our Lord Jesus. And we'll be asking the question, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? Did Jesus trust the Bible? For you and I as Christians, this is the most crucial of all the evidences. Because since He is our Lord, since He is God, He is infallible in His thinking as well as His acting as well as his speaking. And he is without error. And therefore what Jesus believed about the Bible itself must also be infallible and without error. And as Christians, how can our confidence in the Bible be any less than our Lord's confidence? If Jesus believed the Bible was the Word of God, how can you and I, who claim Him as our Lord, believe any differently. So we're going to spend three weeks on the question, did Jesus trust the Bible? Because it is the most crucial of all the evidences. And I contend to you that we will see that Jesus did indeed trust the Scriptures and believe them to be the very words of God. There are seven reasons that we can be confident that Jesus believed the Scriptures to be God's Word. We're going to look at four of those today, and we'll look at the other three in the next two weeks. Reason number one. We know that Jesus believed the Bible was the Word of God because of the titles that He used to describe the Bible. Surely we can look at Jesus and see how he talked about the Scriptures, see how he talked about the Bible, what titles did he give to the Bible, and we can determine what he believed about it, how he felt about it, if he trusted it or not. And what we see, first of all, is that Jesus gave the Bible very exalted titles. In our passage in Mark 7. Now this passage may have confused you a little bit as we were looking at it. And you might think, well, are you saying that the Pharisees got upset with Jesus' disciples because they didn't wash their hands before they ate? I mean, that sounds like something my mom used to say to me. Have you washed your hands yet? Now go wash your hands. Or you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? I mean, if you want to eat without washing your hands, that's fine. Just don't touch my food. So what's the big deal? Well, this had nothing to do with physical cleanliness. Had nothing to do with that at all. Had everything to do with what the Pharisees considered spiritual cleanliness. Had to do with the tradition of the elders. There were two sources of authority in Jesus' day for the religious people. First, there was the tradition of the elders. What the scribes of yesterday had written down about the scriptures or about what they believed to be right. And then there was the scriptures themselves as the authority. Well, what we're going to see in this passage is that the scribes took the tradition of the elders as their utmost authority in their faith and in their lives. Whereas Jesus took the scriptures as his utmost authority. And so the Pharisees, following the tradition of the elders, the elders said before you could eat, you had to go through some ceremonial washing of your hands. And 
If you look at the minute details involved, it does indeed get ridiculous. First, you had to take some water that could be no less than the amount that could be contained in a half of an eggshell. And then you would have to put it on the hand and you would have to rub it, but it would, the water would have to drip off your wrist. If you held your hands down and the water dripped off your fingers, your hands would still be considered unclean. So you had to wash it like this. But well, once you'd wash this hand, then you couldn't rub the dirty hand on the clean hand or it would become dirty again. So you had to rub it on your head or something like that to clean it. And again, it had to fall off your wrist. Well, you had to go through this ceremony two or three times before you could sit down and eat a meal. That's what the elders taught. Jesus, knowing that was ridiculous because it was never taught in Scripture, did not require his disciples to do that. And so the Pharisees are getting upset with him. Why don't you make your disciples go through this ceremonial cleansing that the elders have talked about? And so Jesus said, you know, you guys were prophesied about in the Old Testament. Isaiah said it'd be guys like you who would give lip service to serving God, and you accept as the precepts of men the doctrines of God. You're saying what men say is equal to Scripture. And then Jesus gives them an example of how foolish they are. He says, for instance, you even allow your traditions to invalidate Scripture. The Bible says... Honor your father and mother. That means that when your parents are elderly and they're in physical need, you should help them out. You should materially help them out and give them money to live on. But you Pharisees have come up with this tradition that if a person says, well, what I have is carbon or given to God, then you can't help your parents with it. For instance, say I had a thousand dollars at my disposal. And my parents were in need, and they needed that money uh, in order to pay medical expenses. Well, if I lived in Jesus' day, all I'd have to do is say, Well, you know, Dad, that money's given to God. So I'm freed of any responsibility to help you with it. But I didn't have to give that money to God. I could still do anything I wanted to with it. And so Jesus said, You're a bunch of hypocrites. I mean, you're clearly disobeying God's word in order to keep your foolish traditions. Now, as we are in this conversation, what we're going to see is that Jesus refers to the Scriptures as the commandment of God. Look with me at verse number 8. Jesus says, Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to, to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, and he's talking about the commandment of God. Moses said it, but Jesus said it was the commandment of God. So he is giving Exodus chapter 3, excuse me, Exodus chapter 20, the title of being the commandment of God when he says, honor your father and your mother. And then he quotes from Leviticus chapter 20, He who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus invalidating the word of God. So Jesus uses two titles here to talk about the passage in Exodus and the one in Leviticus, the commandment of God, and the word of God. Also, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus refers to Isaiah as the scriptures. In this passage in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry, and he is in Nazareth, his hometown, and he goes into the synagogue, and he is invited to read the scriptures. And this is where we pick up our story in verse 17 of Luke 4. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written. And it was in Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, 
and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now when Jesus called Isaiah the scripture, he was using a term that was used in his day to speak of the Old Testament as the divine writings of God. He knew that the people who were listening to him would understand that when he called Isaiah the scripture, he was saying that it is the word of God. So clearly, by the titles Jesus used, he believed the Bible to be the very words of God, to be the commandments of God, to be the scriptures. Some critics have said, but preacher, Jesus was simply using the terminology of his day. He was just using what they called it. If that was the case... If Jesus called the Bible the Word of God when it was not, and he knew it was not, but he was simply saying it to accommodate those who were listening and were used to calling it the Word of God, he would have been lying. And if Jesus lied, he was not sinless. And if Jesus was not sinless, he could not be our Savior. And if he cannot be our Savior, we're all doomed for an eternity in hell. So... Either Jesus was telling the truth, or we're all going to hell. That's your two alternatives. And if he was telling the truth, then he was claiming that the Scriptures are indeed the Word of God. That's the first reason I believe Jesus believed the Bible to be God's Word. Secondly, Jesus accepted the words of the Bible as the very words of God. Over in Matthew chapter 22... Jesus is dealing with a controversy over the resurrection. And he quotes from Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush account. And this is what he says. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, who wrote those words? Moses wrote them. Moses penned those words when he wrote the book of Exodus. But yet Jesus ascribes those words to whom? To God. Spoken to you by God. So Jesus was saying the very words that Moses wrote on that parchment were the very words of God. Again, over in Matthew chapter 19, we see in another controversy that Jesus had over the question of divorce, that he attributes the very words of Scripture to being the very words of God. In verse 4, And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's found over in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Who wrote that? Moses. Who does Jesus say those words really belong to? God. Did not the one who created male and female, who created male and female? God. Jesus said, did not God say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother? So Jesus said these very words, though written by the hand of Moses, were actually the very words of God. Now how could Jesus say this? How could he say the words penned by Moses, a human, were actually the words of God? Well, we get an indication of how he could say that over in Matthew 22 where Jesus is quoting from Psalm 110. 
And again, another controversy with the Pharisees. In verse 43, and he said to them, Then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. You see that phrase, in the Spirit? Jesus understood inspiration, like we talked about last week. You remember Peter said that no scripture is of human will, but men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that word moved was used of a, a sailboat being moved across the seas by the wind. Jesus said when men, uh, excuse me, Peter said when men wrote the scriptures, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Though they actually wrote the words, they were the words God wanted them to write. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that David, though he wrote those words, he wrote them in the Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that moved in and through him so that the very words he wrote were the very words of God. And so Jesus is affirming the view of inspiration that Peter had when he says that the very words written on the parchment are the very words of Almighty God. Because it was through His Spirit that He moved through human writers to produce a supernatural book, the Holy Scriptures. So that's the second reason that we believe that Jesus trusted the Bible. First, because of the titles that He used to speak of the Scriptures. Secondly, because... We understand that he used those phrases and terms when he came to answering questions. He said the very words that were written there were the very words of God. Now the third reason. Jesus treated the Old Testament narratives as historical fact. There have been critics of the Bible and liberal scholars who want to tell us that the Bible really is only a collection of stories or myths. That much of the Bible didn't really happen. Like Adam and Eve. That's just an allegory. And Adam and Eve represent the human race. Or take Noah, for example. That's simply a fabrication of a Babylonian flood epic with a man named Gilgamesh. And so the Jews took that story and just fabricated it and made Moses the star of it. Excuse me, made Noah the star of it. So that's not really true. And then take Jonah. Oh, no thinking person would believe Jonah was a real story. I mean, it's just a, a, a parable. Simply about a man getting swallowed by a giant fish. Who ever heard of such a thing? And living in the belly of the fish for three days. That's just a parable. Nobody expects you to believe that's a real fact. And what about Lot? And what about Lot's wife turning into a pillow of salt? Surely nobody believes that. Jesus believed it. Jesus treated those Old Testament narratives as historical Facts. Take, for instance, in Matthew 19, the passage we just saw, when Jesus is talking about divorce, he says, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He didn't say made them males and females. Jesus was speaking of one man, one woman, Adam and Eve. Jesus believed that Adam and Eve, the historical account of the creation, was indeed a true story, a fact. Well, look at the case of Noah. When Jesus is talking about his second coming, he mentions Noah. And he says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood there were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. 
Not the day until Gigamesh entered the ark, but Noah. Jesus believed Noah was a historical figure. That always amazes me why people don't assume that the Babylonians got the story of Noah and fabricated it and made their own story. Why is it the Bible supposedly fabricated the story? I'm going to throw myself with Jesus, join his company, and believe that Noah was a historical figure that built an ark and in the days of the flood got on that ark with his family and God rescued him. What about Jonah? Well, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 12. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For just as Jonah was in was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus treated the story of Jonah as an historical fact. Not a parable, not a myth, not a fabrication, but an historical event. What about Lot? And the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah with the, with the fire and brimstone. What about Lot's wife? Look at what Jesus had to say about that in verse 29. But as to the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Jesus had no trouble believing Lot's wife was a real historical person. He had no trouble believing that because he believed the Bible and knew it to be the Word of God. So let's review. There are three reasons so far that I'm convinced Jesus trusted the Bible and believed it to be God's Word. First, the titles he used. He called it the commandment of God. He called it the Word of God. He called it the Scripture. Next, we also saw that when Jesus was answering questions, He went to the Scriptures and He treated the words of Scripture as the very words of God. Although they were written by human writers, He accepted them as the actual words of God. And then thirdly, He treated the historical narratives of the Scripture as actual fact, events. That brings us to the fourth and final reason we'll look at today. And that is that Jesus saw the Old Testament as predictive of Himself. Now since the Old Testament prophesied and predicted the events in the life of Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus ever came, it has to be a divine book. No human book could make such prophecies hundreds of years in advance. And so when Jesus goes to the Scriptures and He says, Look, this was written about me hundreds of years ago. He is saying that the Bible is no human book. It is indeed a divine book, the Word of God. And we see this in two different places. First, over in John's Gospel. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees again. And he says in John 5, 39, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Jesus said it is the Scripture that witnesses about me, that tells you about me. Though it was written five, six, seven hundred or more years before Jesus ever came on earth. He believed it was a divine book. Also, you remember when Jesus had been resurrected and He was walking on the road to Emmaus or, and some of His disciples were walking and they met up. And you remember they were eating a meal together and Jesus began to teach them. And look at what the Scripture says. Now He, Jesus, said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about Me in the law of Moses 
and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Written about me, Jesus said. He clearly saw the Old Testament as predictive of himself. Therefore, it could be no human book. Jesus believed the Bible to be God's very word. Because of the titles he used to describe it, because of the phrases he said when he said these words are the very words of God, though they were written by Moses, because he saw the historical stories as actual facts, and because he knew that the Scripture prophesied about him. Now since Jesus is our Lord, and He is infallible, and He is without error, what He believed about the Bible must also be infallible. It must be absolutely correct. And how can you and I, as believers as those who surrender to Jesus as Lord, have any different view of Scripture than He had. Since it is God's Word, we need to study it, we need to believe it, we need to live it. It's one thing to say it is the Word of God. It's another thing to live like it is the Word of God. Have you surrendered to the authority of Scripture in your life? Do you seek to bring your life up to the level of His Word? Are you seeking to bring your marriage up to the level of His Word? Are you seeking to bring your parenting up to the level of His Word? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the testimony of our Lord about your word. And we have to look no further than our Lord Jesus to see that indeed the Bible is your authoritative word. May we be strengthened and encouraged by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Since the Bible is the Word of God, it is the only true source that you and I have to know how a person can go to heaven. It's the only true source. Because when it's all said and done, it only matters what God thinks. And to find out what God says about how one can go to heaven, we must look to His Word. And He says, Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call upon means you realize you need Jesus. You realize that you have sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard of holiness. You realize you cannot earn salvation, you cannot purchase it, no matter what you do. And so you realize your need for Jesus. And you call upon Him. You ask Him to save you. You realize He did everything necessary through His perfect life. He lived the life you and I couldn't live. He took our place on that cross. He died for us. He came alive from the dead. He conquered death and sin. And He's alive today. And we recognize that. And we call upon Him saying, Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And then we surrender our will to His will as our Lord. You see, the devil knows Jesus died for sin. The devil knows Jesus was God. The devil knows Jesus came alive from the dead. But you know what the devil won't do? Not until he has to. He will not surrender his will to the will of Jesus. He will not take Jesus as Lord. So we must come to a place that our faith in Jesus as our Savior is so great that we surrender to Him as Lord of our lives. Our will to His will. If that's your heart's desire today, would you step forward as we sing?
Let me pray with you. Uh, we have trained counselors who will be glad to speak with you as well. And help you to know what it means to know Jesus. Step out in obedience to the Holy Spirit as we sing.